All right, rhetorical rock stars, we are back with another basics lesson. This is rhetorical basics lesson number three, clauses, as always, prepared by me, Mr. Lassard, and in conjunction with the requirements laid out by the College Board for our class. Um, this is a bit of a timely lesson also, because as I make this for you, I'm also in the middle of grading a bunch of papers and I am noticing that every single one of us needs to work on this one. Um, it's going to be a little bit tricky, uh, but I also think that because of what I'm seeing in these papers, uh, it's going to be a really important one moving forward with the class. So let's get started. We will first talk about what a clause is, um, and this definition has some confusing aspects to it because there are multiple aspects, so bear with me and hopefully it'll all make sense in the end. So our basic definition of a clause is this. It's a group of words expressing a complete or an incomplete thought and making up part of a compound or complex sentence. So we've got multiple things going on here. We can have a complete thought or an incomplete thought, and you may be wondering well, what the heck is a, an incomplete thought? And like I said, bear with me and we'll go over that. Um, but then also uh, when we're talking about clauses, we're talking about combining them in order to make compound or complex sentences. So sentences that have multiple parts to them. Um, and then in order to fully understand this, we need to know that there are basically two types of clauses. The first type of clause is a, an independent clause, uh, like Batman is independent in this picture over here. You know, he's standing up there, he's looking out over Gotham, and he is the sole independent kind of uh, vigilante doling out justice to, to the city, right? So an independent clause works in much the same way. It modifies a complete sentence, uh, but it stands alone as its own sentence in its own right. Uh, because, and it can do this because it, it, it contains a complete thought. So just as Batman kind of is a fully kind of self-realized person, he's able to kind of stand alone as, as his own hero. Uh, I hope that metaphor makes sense. It took me a while to come up with any kind of interesting picture to put on this slide, to be honest. Uh, here's this, the second type of clause, though, and this is where it gets tricky. And these are dependent clauses. So dependent clauses are, you know, they depend on something else in order to, in order to work, right? You are a dependent of your parents because you can't exist on your own. Uh, yet you can't support yourselves financially, you can't, you know, th do those, or it would be very hard for you to do so at this point. Uh, so that's why I've got this picture now, right? We, we add Robin into the picture. Robin is dependent upon Batman uh, in order to, to be able to complete his, his journey. So a dependent clause modifies a complete sentence. Um, and a complete sentence, just to be clear, contains a subject and a verb. However, uh, dependent clauses cannot stand alone as their own complete thoughts. So they do express a thought, but that thought is not complete. So I guess to complete the metaphor here, we just need to realize that, you know, while Batman can stand alone, he's independent. Batman can also be, uh, you know, paired with his sidekick Robin, who is dependent, and together they can they can form a complete, uh, a more complete and more complex uh, hero uh, team or um, a more complex thought. Uh, and I'm sorry if that metaphor is not as perfect as as uh, you want it to be. So let's now take this and talk about why it's relevant to what I'm seeing in our writing at this moment. Uh, so before we talk about the rhetorical function, which is important, um, I'm just gonna take a second and talk about a practical function. And that's, the practical function is 
in response to exactly what I've been seeing in our writing um, as I've been kind of working my way through these papers. Um, so this practical function is that knowing the difference between the different types of clauses and how clauses work is going to help us avoid needlessly incomplete sentences. Now, I was really careful about how I phrased this, um, uh, this piece of advice. I, I added the word needlessly because there will be times, and we can get into this later on, where incomplete sentences work really well for certain things. Um, there are moments in our writing, actually when we were talking about syntax in an earlier lesson, you know, we we did do quite a bit of work with just using incomplete sentences um, to to kind of do some artistic stuff with our writing. However, um, there are also times when sentences are needlessly incomplete. And essentially what I mean by that is when you write an incomplete sentence and you don't even know that it's incomplete and an, in, an incomplete sentence, then you probably need to make sure that you're fixing that. Uh, it doesn't, it's not serving any larger purpose. Um, so I really want you to kind of internalize that because you can't just go around writing sentences and, and not even knowing that they're incomplete. And knowing the difference between these clauses and the way that they work will really help you out, I think. Um, then, of course, there are the rhetor rhetorical functions of clauses. Um, so uh, in addition to just making sure that you're writing complete sentences, uh, clauses can also ensure that you're writing sentences with varied ser sentence structures. Uh, we like sentences that um, are not the same as the sentences that are that that surround them. When we speak or when we write, if we're using the same sentence structure over and over and over again, our, our writing starts to sound robotic, uh, and it kind of turns our audience off. And knowing how to use clauses effectively is really going to help you kind of mix it up with your writing and uh, have writing that flows and, and also keeps your audience engaged. Uh, a second rhetorical function is to ensure complex sentence structures. So building sentences that, similar to that first piece of rhetorical advice, that, that don't all look the same, that don't all sound the same, that kind of, uh, that, that just, you know, are interesting to look at and to listen to, um, and also complex where you can add layers of meaning uh, into the sentence because of the way that clauses are being used. Finally, uh, there, um, the, there are ways to emphasize important ideas by, by how we construct those clauses, by how we fit them together. So similar to what we were talking about with syntax, where depending on how you decide to structure your language. The way that you put clauses together is going to allow you to bring out certain ideas and uh, bury other less important ideas, not bury them, but you know, kind of move them to the background. So what I've got over here on the right then are six independent clause, dependent clause pairs. Um, where each one kind of goes with the other, or I've, I've, I've attempted to do that. Um, so, well, let, let's just take a look at, at a couple of examples. So this, this first example, our independent clause is Batman collects evidence, and our dependent clause is as Robin keeps watch. See how I did that with the independent Batman and the dependent Robin? I thought that was creative. Give me a little credit here. Um, so the independent clause Batman creates evidence is fine as its own sentence. It can function independently. You, it's got a subject, Batman. It's got a verb, uh, collects. Uh, so, you know, we could even end it there. Um, I mean, we could put a period at the end of those three words and call it a sentence. Uh, the in, the de dependent clause, as Robin keeps watch, is not a complete thought. And the reason it's not a complete thought is because of that word as. As Robin keeps watch implies that there's more to it, right? That there's something else going on and that other thing going on is Batman collecting evidence. So the two have to be put together in order for that dependent clause to work. A second example 
Batman missed a clue. Again, it's an independent clause because uh, it can function as its own sentence. Batman missed is its own sentence, a subject and a verb. We've just added a clue there. Uh, but again, with the dependent clause, because Robin distracted him, it's, a, it's not a complete thought. The word because implies that there's something else going on, and that's Batman missing the clue. We need both parts in order for for uh, the dependent clause to work. Third, we've got Batman drove. This is a really simple sentence, right? But it's an independent clause because it has a subject and a verb. Uh, and then the dependent clause, although Robin had his license. And again, it's that word although that sets it off as a dependent clause that Robin Robin having his license needs that extra bit of information because we uh, about Batman driving because we have the word although it implies that there's going to be this contrast contrasting idea uh, to Robin having his license. A few more and then we'll wrap this up. Um, third, Batman returned from patrol again. Complete thought, independent clause. Put a period at the end. Subject verb. Batman returned. We're good. Uh, dependent clause is so Robin could take his nap. Same basic idea. Uh, the word so sets it up uh, in a way that requires the sentence, re requires the clause to have an additional piece of information before we have a complete sentence. Now these last two are a little bit different. Um, if we start off with this fifth example, Robin learned the hard way. Notice that I've learned, I've uh, moved Robin over to independent status, um, but he's learning the hard way here. Oh, I, it was funny to me at the time. Uh, so that, that again, is an independent clause. Over here in the dependent clause section is we're starting with a type of word called a gerund, gerund uh, which is forgetting. That's an ing word, word, forgetting his shark repellent. Forgetting his shark repellent is a um, is a dependent clause because the verb forget has been turned into a noun. Forgetting his shark repellent is a thing that has happened to Robin. It's not a complete thought. Forgetting his shark repellent doesn't tell me anything about the effect uh, that forgetting his shark uh, repellent is having. And so um, we have to you know, we have to add again that independent clause to make this this thought complete. Um, and then finally, another form of gerund for the dependent clause is chased by the joker. Chase is a verb on its own, but by adding that D, we're turning it into a noun, um, in this case anyway. So, uh, that can also be a past tense verb, uh, but in this case it's being used as a noun. Uh, and so there is no complete thought construction in that in this dependent clause. We do have an independent clause with re Robin peeled out of the alley, uh, chased by the Joker though, so he's kind of failing again here because I was still trying to be funny when I was writing these. Um, so we have to be sure that that dependent clause has the independent clause to finish off the thought. Now here's the deal, and the reason that I've given a six is because all six of these dependent clauses are the types of dependent clauses that I'm seeing in our writing. Uh, people are assuming that sentences that they're starting with words like as, because, although, so, as well as sentences that they're starting with gerunds like ing words um, and ed words, they're assuming that those are complete sentences and they're not. Um, so what I'm ending up writing on a lot of these papers is this is an incomplete sentence. This is an incomplete sentence. This is an incomplete sentence. And I'm worried that you're going to read those comments and not know why they're incomplete sentences. So this lesson is intended to give you several uh, examples of the types of sentences that I'm marking as incomplete so that you understand that they're incomplete because what you're doing is providing a dependent clause without an independent clause. You always have to add that independent clause to make it complete. Now here's the trick to get back to the rhetorical function of things. Sorry, this is a little bit long, but 
um, it's it's really important to making our writing more um, strengthening our writing. Um, these sentences or these clauses can be structured in multiple ways to create complete sentences. I'm just going to do one for you and I'm going to leave the rest for practice. So let's do the first one. Batman collects evidence as Robin keeps watch. The easy construction of that is Batman collects evidence as Robin keeps watch, period. It's a, it's a complex sentence. It's two parts, an independent and a dependent clause. However, if we want to mix it up, we can switch them around. As Robin keeps watch, Batman collects evidence, period. Uh, and then we would also put a comma after watch in that case. So we can flip them around and the sentence works um, just as well. But in this case, we're focused a little bit more on Robin and a little bit less on Batman. Uh, the third option, and in this case, it's a little bit clunky, but um, but let's just go with it because sometimes it works and well and other times it doesn't, is we can embed the dependent clause in the middle um, in the middle of the of the independent clause. So this one would go something like this, Batman, comma, as Robin keeps watch, comma, collects evidence. Uh, so we have an even more complex um, construction kind of implying that, you know, these two people are doing uh, two, two separate tasks at the same time, which makes it interesting. Now, I don't necessarily like that third version of the sentence for these two clauses. I think it's kind of unnecessary but it's possible to do. Um, and the same is true for all the rest of these five examples. So now that you've listened to me go on and on and on about this, let's do a little bit of practice. 